Hello, everyone. Welcome to the College Football Playbook Podcast. I'm Mark Givler. Got Tyler Shoemaker with me as usual. Um, we are, what, maybe eight Saturdays, I think, away from college football starting. Um, we are getting close to the season, and so uh, I thought this would be a good time to kind of go through and do some conference previews as we uh, hit media days here in a few weeks. Uh, we'll ha- We'll start to have the first conference media days here in the middle of July, so we are right on the doorstep of football season. Um, Tyler here has been working really hard on his spreadsheets for the season. Um, the the T-shoe index is uh, is complete, at least, for, at least for the preseason. And uh, we're going to go over some of those numbers here. Uh, but uh, first of all, I mean, we're going to do the Big 12 um, in this episode. Did anything surprise you? Um, Tyler, when you went through and kind of punched your numbers in and, and they spit things back out at you? So I wasn't surprised at the top, you know, to see Texas at number one uh, in, in the conference. But what did surprise me was, I mean, they're number one by almost eight full points. I mean, of you know, over a touchdown better than than number two. And then what really jumped out to me is you look at number two, three, four and five, and they're separated by a point. So it's it's extremely tight. Um, I actually have the Big 12 as the number two overall conference in terms of average power rating, because I mean, WVU is ranked last, but they're only a minus 0.8. So they're basically one point worse than the FBS average team. Everybody else in the conference is above average. So, I mean, it's, it's a very uh, sturdy conference with only one kind of what I would consider true playoff, you know, national championship contender in Texas, but, but very solid uh, conference from top to bottom. And just kind of refresh everyone's memory. Um, you know, you don't have to give the whole formula away or anything like that. But you know, th- this index you put together, um, the TSI, what all kind of goes into that, and kind of how do you how do you arrive at some of these numbers? Yeah. So the the preseason numbers, you know, just generally are much harder because you don't have any current season data to go off of. Obviously, so uh, the the challenge that I kind of put on myself for for this upcoming season that I haven't done in seasons past that I think has, has cost me and has cost other people like me that, that do models. Um, I had to find a way, I really spent a lot of time thinking about how to quantify and reward teams that develop really well, even though they don't recruit at an elite level and conversely penalize teams like, I mean, even Texas, for example, who recruits excellently, but that hasn't necessarily translated to, a high power rating or, you know, or, uh, winning, winning football on the field. So I spent a lot of time, a lot of trial and error going through different formulas and variations of that. And I feel pretty comfortable with, with where I landed and I'm excited to see kind of how it plays out because, um, to, to get back to your original question, what goes into it is how you performed in, in recent, uh, recent seasons, according to uh, the TSI motto, I've gone back and, and modeled out, uh, the last, the last decade of football, I'm going to go back even farther, but for right now, I, I looked at the last decade, obviously looked at the past couple of seasons way more closely, uh, as well as did you have any coaching changes? Um, kind of, I wanted to get an idea of how each coach and program has performed relative to their talent, uh, which is kind of a baseline expectation of how good your team should be. So I was able to quantify that and, I'll put that into uh, into a number, and that that's uh, how we landed on the preseason TSI right now. Yeah, I think um, what surprised you also surprised me, which is that I was surprised to see not necessarily see Texas one, although maybe, but uh, just the gap to me. Um, Texas has, for all of its talent, has not been the dominant force in that conference that. Um, they probably should be where I guess was the strength here. How, how were they so far ahead? What kind of, where were the metrics, um, you know, that that gave them such a high power ranking? Uh, well, for, for starters, their, their four year weighted recruiting ranking, which is kind of how I look at your baseline talent. I, I look at the last four years, uh, weight those according to kind of what I've, learned uh, is is most important in terms of which classes are more important. Uh, so Texas right now is number seven in the country uh, in terms of their recruiting ranking. So that's that's a good baseline. But 
Oklahoma is right as one spot below them uh, in the rankings at, at number eight. So I, the difference is Oklahoma, especially like last year, did not perform well relative to the talent on their team, mostly because they were in year year one, you know, of a of a new regime. So I did give Oklahoma a little bit of benefit of the doubt going into this season, but Texas, um, you know, they have steadily under Sark, their their correlation, as I like to say, between their talent and their power rating has has slowly crept up, even though they haven't really met expectations publicly. Their their numbers have incrementally been climbing. So I, I gave them a bit of a uh, an optimistic projection here for 2023 based on those trends. Yeah, I think I think it's clear they have the most talent on paper i mean we can go down the the line here you know starting at quarterback with with quinn ewers and uh you know they've got receivers they've got a great tight end um so i i'm high on their talent level it's just you know i I was kind of in the boat of like when they hired sark i was like well did you hire you know usually when you make a coaching hire you are going from kind of one end to the other on the spectrum like you go from, you know, if you've got like this hard nosed coach, you probably bring in like a, a more laid back guy and vice versa. If you got a laid back guy and you know the culture kind of gets away, you bring in someone who's going to, you know, kick ass and take names. When they hired Sark, I thought they hired Tom Herman light. Yeah, um, that's, that's a, a very good comparison. <laughs> like there's a, anything bad you want to say about Tom Herman, you can apply to Sark. And I would argue Herman's been a more successful coach, um, yep. especially as a head coach. So I, I'm still just not sold there. And I'm, I'm curious, like, did, did any of that factor in as far as their power rating? Um, you kind of mentioned, you know, do they do they overperform or underperform? I'm, I'm guessing you, there was an underperform that maybe held them back even more on this because but you're projecting about like 10 wins. Yeah, I mean, they they could have been higher, certainly. And for for all the reasons you said, you know, is, is why they landed where they landed. But I will, you know, for people that aren't familiar with with TSI or or even like SP plus or FEI you don't get rewarded necessarily for wins and you don't get punished necessarily for losses, you know, depending on how you played in the, in those games. So I think the thing with Texas last year, when you just look at their wins and losses, it was like, man, they, they lost, you know, more games than you would think. I I think they went eight and four last year. I don't have in front of me. I think they went eight and four, but a lot of those games were, were very, very close so the the numbers within the obviously like win loss is the most important in terms of on the field, but in terms of a power rating exercise and trying to be predictive moving forward, we kind of have to look between the lines and see like how those how the teams actually performed because football is a game of of variance and and a lot of luck is involved. So the power rating aspect of it actually really liked Texas last year. Even I mean even after they were racking up their third and fourth losses, I mean I, I remember they were still kind of around my top 10 and, and I was kind of catching some heat for it on Twitter. Like, well, how do you have this team in the top 10? Like, but that's why, because it's not just about wins and losses necessarily. And, you know, looking at their schedule here, I'll just kind of reel it off home rice at Alabama, home, Wyoming at Baylor, home, Kansas, uh, neutral Oklahoma, um, at Houston, home BYU, home Kansas State, at TCU, at Iowa State, home Texas Tech. So, and, you know, to be fair to you, um, the Vegas over-under I'm seeing on win total for Texas is nine and a half, and you've got them at nine seven. So you're you're right there on that, on Vegas's number. Um, so here's a question. You're at nine seven. Vegas is at nine five. Is that too close to suggest a bet on the over? Is that a stay away number for you? It it is when you when you just look at that when you just look at like how the math shakes out. I've got them at nine point seven. Um, I haven't done this exercise, but what I would do if you know if you're a Texas fan or or someone that's like, hey, I think Texas is is going to go over this. I need some more data to to kind of back up my opinion. What I would do is. 
I would go to their schedule breakdown, which I have on my on my TSI sheet, which you can find on Twitter. Um, we'll put it I would in the description go, box too. Yeah, I would I would go to their schedule breakdown because what I've done is I've, I've done every I've done a projection for every single game for every team all season with a win probability. And what I would do in that instance is I would look at it and say, okay, well, how many of these games do they have a seventy five percent chance or more of winning? And if that number gets you close to that to that um, Vegas over under, then then that's what would push me push me to to make an over bet. But if it's if if it's they're going to win a bunch of close games like that, that's more of a, a roll of the dice, I think. And you know, I'm kind of like quickly looking at the schedule here, and it does feel like it sets up decently well, um, especially in conference. Like Kansas State's a tough place to play; they don't have to go there. Um, BYU is not a very easy place to play. They don't have to go there. Um, you know, Oklahoma is always a neutral field. They lose to Texas tech last year, but they're getting them at home. Um, you know, I, I maybe, you know, roadblocks at Iowa state's kind of a sneaky one there. After you just were, if you just get through Kansas state and TCU back to back, then you go to Iowa state. Um, Matt Campbell for me is the, Pat Fitzgerald of the Big 12. Whenever the expectations are a nine or 10 win team, they flop. And whenever nobody is talking about them and have kind of written the program off as, as not a contender anymore, they come out and win eight or nine games and they're like, well, where'd that come from? So that could be a, a sneaky, tough game. As I look at this, as much as I like am not like sold on Sark at this point, um, it, it it's a schedule that does set up really well, I think, for the over as as long as they don't just completely you know trip over themselves. Because I think here's the dirty little secret, and this will be a different podcast episode, and get a bunch of people riled up probably, and, and put myself at risk for being on freezing cold takes. But I don't think Alabama is going to be very good this year by their standards. Like I don't think. I could totally see Alabama losing three plus games this year, like three, maybe four worst case, but like, I think Alabama's gonna lose three games this year. You're getting them early. Yes. It's on the road, but they've got a whole bunch of stuff they're breaking in. So it, for me, I think the, the Texas bet, the over under comes down to, do they beat Alabama at the beginning? If they beat Alabama on the road at the beginning of the season, they're in great shape. I think to, to get the over for people. Yeah, I, I just I just took a quick peek while you were talking and basically looking at their win probabilities, there's nine games where there's 75% uh win probability or better. So it comes down to do they win one of TCU, Baylor, or Alabama? If they win one of those games, they go over the win total. If they take care of business in those games where they're 75% chance or better. So that's kind of how you have to look at those things. Yeah. Um let's throw these back up here real quick. Kansas State, I thought, was was in line with what I would be thinking. I, I really like that program. I like the direction they're going. You know, TCU, that's kind of fascinating. Uh, against maybe all odds, <laughs> we kind of yep. kept saying they were going to lose last year, and we were wrong until the very end. But, um, you know, you play in the national championship game, and you're picked fifth in your league. You know, you're essentially picked fifth in your league, like by the slimmest of margins, but just behind a UCF team you know, joining the league. Where did TCU uh, falter for you as you kind of put that uh, one together? TCU was was very difficult because they their program hasn't necessarily like overachieved from a talent standpoint you know, relative to their talent. But last year was just so great. And and it was in the first year of a coach in Sonny Dykes. So I did give them, honestly, their rating could have been much lower based on where, like taking like an average of how the last few years have gone for them uh, in terms of their talent to uh, power rating correlation. But because Sonny Dykes did such a good job, I went back and looked, he did such a good job in that in that metric for me when he was at SMU. And then it translated so well last year that I'm, I gave TCU some benefit of the doubt here. Um, I've got them 32nd uh, in talent, um, but with a with a really high development rating. So I'm I'm. This is basically a vote of confidence in Sonny Dykes to, you know, not necessarily replicate what he did last year because I think that'd be very difficult. But 
but can can keep the ship, you know, kind of going in the right direction here. And here's kind of a essentially a line graph of uh, how the power ratings came out. Um, you know, Oklahoma's an interesting one too. They they kind of bombed last year. It felt like they were starting to play a little better toward the end. How did you arrive at that one? And so it's clear your model is projecting them to to start back up on the upswing with a second year coach. Yeah. Uh, I, again, I, I gave I gave some benefit of the doubt to what I think Brent Venables can be once he gets it rolling there. Um, so I did kind of go back and look at kind of what Oklahoma has been, you know, in its peak years, and then looked at what it did last year, and then kind of found myself somewhere in the middle of that. Like I don't think they're going to be peak Oklahoma, you know, under Lincoln Riley this year, but I do think they'll be better than last year. Um, so I, I think they're pretty uh, appropriate, appropriately rated, even if it was, you know, one of the trickier ones for, uh, for me to, to formulate. How far has West Virginia fallen as a program in the last maybe decade ish? I mean, you got them last, you got all the, you got all the non power five schools that moved into the league ahead of them. Yeah, they're um, <laughs> for for such a passionate fan base. Um, it's it's probably going to be going to be a rough season for them. I, I would imagine this season is the nail in the coffin of uh, head coach Neil Brown. Yeah, four wins would be uh, a whole lot of not good. Um, another another program like Oklahoma State, six wins. This was not that long ago that they were winning nine, ten games every year. Yep. Um, gosh, so that that was another one that kind of like. It didn't really shock me in, in the in the sense that, oh, I think it's wrong. It just was like a like, wow, yeah, Oklahoma State yeah. <laughs> stock down right now. Um, here's what I'll say about TCU, just kind of for me from covering recruiting, they've got a lot more juice now with recruits than they did two years ago. That's, um, that's a school that a lot of kids even in, in Texas are looking at. They just got a really, really good quarterback in 2025. Ty Hawkins was just committed there uh, this past week. Um, he's a like a, a, a mid to high four star type of kid. He's a really good player. Um, so, you know, we'll be interested to kind of go back and look at this in a couple of years because if if they can actually um, sustain maybe not what they did last year, but if they can sustain some level of, of moderate success, your talent level ratings are going to go up for them in the next couple of years because they are yep. starting to recruit better. So how much, how much of that do you think is, is Sonny Dykes related? Um, Cause I, I feel like he's just done a good job. I mean, like I said, even, even at SMU, he, he got some talent there and they, and they won a lot of games. Yeah. I think a lot of it is Sonny Dykes related. Just, he it's it's a fun offense i think for a lot of guys to to play in um and of course like the, the playoff run last year is huge but that's also you know that also goes back to sonny dykes who got them right, there. So, right. um yeah it's it, it's definitely been a huge uptick he's kind of a little more relatable you know gary patterson i thought was a good coach but i don't know that he was a yeah particularly dynamic recruiter he's kind of a, a Chip Kelly type of head coach in that regard where you better have really good as recruiters around them as assistants. So um, that was, you know, Dykes, I think is a little more in the, in the, the front, you know, kind of leading the pack when it comes to recruiting. So yeah, I've got TCU stock up. I've got Kansas state stock up. It, this is a big year for Oklahoma. I, I didn't love the fit. And it kind of goes back to what I talked about kind of at the beginning of the show a little bit is you went from like offensive, like guru, you know, high flying offense, um, you know, a little bit of Hollywood, a little bit of, you know, I don't know, flash. And you go from that to, you know, career defensive coordinator, old school guy, toughness. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but that is quite a transition to make. And um, sometimes it it sometimes is best, even if the personalities are different, to maybe keep a similar face of the program. So maybe go and try and find the next Lincoln Riley instead of kind of going 
polar opposite. So I'm going to be fascinated with that one. I, it was a kind of a strange hire to me at the time, much like Texas was to me um, for different reasons. But, um, you know, we'll see how it goes. Uh, you know, Texas was was firing a coach. Oklahoma was losing a coach. It's kind of a different scenario. I think I think yeah. when, you're, when you're firing a coach, I think it, it does make a little more sense to kind of go in a different direction than what you had been going in, obviously. But when you're when you lose a coach because he decides to leave and he's been very successful, it it, is not usually it doesn't seem bad to me to maybe kind of stick with that. And and quite frankly, I I just in today's landscape with offense, I I do think having an offensive minded head coach is is a is a general advantage. But yeah, now Kirby Smart's going to laugh at me and Nick Saban's going (laughs) to laugh at me. But I think if you're if you're at you know, if you're at Oklahoma, if you're in the, the Big 12, if you're in basically any other league than maybe the SEC, which is somehow still able to survive on kind of being a defense first league, although even that's changing, too, with with we've seen Nick Saban kind of wake up on on offensive philosophy, philosophy and things like that. And Georgia last year was was a much better offense. Yep. But, um, you know, I don't know. I, I think there's it was a weird hire. Let's just put it that way. Um, yep. Anything else here as far as, you know, tidbits? I mean, you've got – so you got UCF up there. Um, that's going to be an interesting one to me. Um, what, what? How did you arrive at that, and was, was it difficult with the, with the league change? Yeah, it, it was um, – I'm looking. I've got them – 53rd uh in in the country in in talent but i mean they've they've just performed so well even relative to that you know looking back several years so they they're kind of a program that gets the benefit of the doubt until they prove that they don't deserve it and again what you know one thing that really sets the TSI model apart from others is i'm much more quickly adapting to the on-field results than, uh, you know, other high profile models, because basically if some of these other models say that you're a a bad team uh, in the preseason, like that's kind of a death sentence for the seat for their, for their season rating, because they keep those preseason ratings in there the whole season, you know, to some extent, whereas with mine, I I generally will have mine uh, completely phased out by, by the middle of the season. I'm trying. So here's the here's the Vegas total, and this could be very different at different places. But Vegas has over six and a half wins, but it is minus one seventy um, for UCF. So, it do you would you endorse the over here, or is this something maybe to stay away from just because of the league change and talent? Yeah, awful talent yeah, discrepancies. Well, yeah, those those reasons, and also like I wouldn't I wouldn't lay one seventy juice to to bet the over here. I honestly I would just if if you can some books will let you like buy a half a half a game if you can do do that. Um, I'm sorry, not buy, but but basically sell a half a game and just take the higher number here and, and get better odds, or just wait. I mean, if it's juiced at one seventy, the number's probably going to go up at some point. So I would just wait um, in, until you catch a seven at, at you know minus 110 or minus 120 or something like that more more standard odds there um but yeah i would i would be interested in a uh, ucf over do you have a favorite play as far as over under win totals in this conference is there a is there one that jumps out to you um i not off the top of my head let me let me get back to you on that one <laughs> yeah no no problem i Man, I'm almost talking myself into Texas. Um, that's kind of an interesting one for me, just because again, I'm I'm a little skeptical of Alabama this year. I I just, man, I don't know. They lost so much, and I don't like what they did in the portal with the quarterback. I don't think they solved their quarterback issue. Um, so that's gonna be t- that's gonna be an interesting one for me. Um. Let me see what Kansas State is here for uh, over under win total because that's one I think if I can get the right number I'd be interested in playing that one. Looks like seven and a half, but you're given like one eighty eight juice. Let me see what uh, 
me see what Bet Online saying. There's a. I should have brought this up a minute ago, and then I could have had it ready. Um, yeah, I see. I see but, a WVU uh, five and a half. Uh, I would. I would definitely be interested in an, in an under there. Uh, yeah. Even, again, again, pretty much with with season win totals, I'm not going to lay any more than like 140 or 150 juice. Probably. Okay. Um, so so that's I, a good I just, um, So I would just keep that in mind. Like I'm, I'm not going to lay 170 or 180 on it. I'll mm-hmm. just wait for the, for the number to move. But yeah, I would be interested in a in a WVU under five and a half. Um, again, you can get uh, U- UCF over. I like uh, Houston is is one of the the more valuable. Uh, o- over bets on on the board for for any conference, let alone the the Big Twelve. So, there, yeah, there's a there's a couple of plays here that uh that I probably will invest in here before the end of the summer. And it's interesting because I just looked at Bet Online and they've got Kansas State at over under eight is is eight and a half, and over is plus one twenty juice. So, so under is uh, minus one fifty. And they come out of the gates with Southeast Missouri and Troy. Then they're at Missouri, home UCF, at Oklahoma State, at Texas Tech. They get TCU at home. They get Houston and Baylor at home. They get Iowa State at home. Tough road one at Kansas. Looks like they don't play Oklahoma. I like Kansas. I, I think there's value there at plus 120. I think there's actually some value there in Kansas State yep. over eight and a half. Yeah, with, with with the projection so close, getting getting positive money, I would I would have to plug it in. Uh, I've got a calculator where you can kind of see what what that would equate to in terms of like an actual number. But yeah, it's, that's probably right in the neighborhood. Yeah. Um. All right. I, we see what your numbers are projecting here, but you know. You don't always have to follow the numbers necessarily. Who is your pick to win the Big Twelve this year? I, I do think it's going to be Texas. I, I, I think I think this is probably the year that they kind of put it together. Second second year Quinn Ewers um, at quarterback. I if it's not now, then like when is it ever going to be? So I think I think this has to be their year. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the Longhorns. I have to begrudgingly agree. I. What do you do if they go eight and four this year? If you're Texas, fire you your coach. For starters, <laughs> yeah. are you pulling the plug again on that? Well, I think you. Are, ha- I think you have another to. coaching search. I think you have to. I don't know. I don't know how you you run it back knowing um, Quinn yours is probably entering the draft this year. Like I don't. I, I don't Sanders know. might be a first round pick at tight end. Xavier Worthy might be a first round pick at receiver. Yeah, I mean, I know you got you got you Arch Manning, more athletes, but yeah, I mean, I, you have more athletes on defense than these other teams are playing for the most part, other than like Alabama. I mean, I mean, even even I mean, I think eight and four definitely is is a fireable season. Nine and three, which which means you're so that's like you're probably losing to Alabama, and, and then you lose two conference games, and and you're not even in the conference championship game. Like I I think that's a fireable offense uh, with, with the expectations that they've just continuously had every preseason. Like if you, if you don't, if you don't go 10 and two or better. So, you know, one conference loss, we'll say a loss to Bama. Like, I think, I think that's the floor uh, for, for Sark to keep his job. If I was running things anyway. And we'll kind of wrap it up with one more hot seat conversation. Like Matt Campbell, that's an interesting one. They've, it feels like they've plateaued, maybe even taken a step or two back. What do you do if he goes like five and seven this year and loses to Iowa and, you know, and it's just a mess? I mean, it's just such a conundrum for me because I thought they moved on from Paul Rhodes awfully quick back in the day. And, you know, I think it's hard to win there, but, you know, should his seat be warm or is he just, you know, bringing a knife to a gunfight every weekend and, and you, you, you give him the Pat Fitzgerald treatment, you know, at Northwestern where, you know, you're going to eat a four and eight every now and then, but he's going to overachieve as well at certain points. Well, here's the thing. I just looked, this is going to be Iowa state's most talented team. Uh, I'm looking back to, to by the rankings. Right. So this is going to be their most talented team 
uh, in, of the last five years. So there's there's no reason they should go five and seven. So I, I think I think if that happens, it's hard because they're the the program expectations just are not what they are at like a, like a Texas. So maybe they do have their Pat Fitzgerald and they're just gonna let him have as many losing seasons as he wants because he had a couple good ones. But there there's no reason that if he can have really good seasons, you know, that he's had, you know, in, in recent years that he can't do that again this year with, with more talent. So, um, I don't, I don't think he would necessarily be on the hot seat, but I, I personally would not be on the Matt Campbell bandwagon if he has another bad year. Guess what the over under is in Vegas right now for wins for Iowa state. I don't have it in front of me. What is it? Yeah. Guess. Six and a half. Five and a half. I just looked it up before I even said anything about going five and seven or after I said about going five and seven, I'm like, let me look and see what Vegas thinks. They're five and a half. Now it's minus 140 for the over. What's your limit on juice for these bets? Cause you said you wouldn't, you would never do minus 170. Um, is yeah, minus I, 140. Are we getting close to where, especially if you think, you know, six and six, that's all I got to do is go six and six when half their games. Yeah. I mean, it, w- it would definitely depend on the edge. So in this instance, they're over unders five and a half. I've got them at, at 6.7. Um, so you've got them way over. Yeah. So I, and, and what'd you say the juice was on this? 140? I would, 140. I would, I wouldn't like bet my mortgage on it or anything, which will talk about uh, bankroll management at some point this season. But, um, you know, I, I would maybe throw something small on it. Sure. You could probably what bump it up to six, but then it's like, uh, yeah, I, honestly, at yeah. six, at six, you're probably getting, I don't know, maybe even odds at that, yeah. at that point. So but then they got to go, you know, obviously they got to go seven and five at that point or yeah, not yeah. Even push. I mean, they play, uh, gosh, they play what Northern Iowa here. They're at Ohio U, Kansas at home. At Cincinnati, they got TCU in Texas. They got Oklahoma. The conference schedule is not easy. They didn't dodge a lot of bullets there. At Baylor, at BYU, at Kansas State. Those are tough road environments at Oklahoma. Oh, buddy. Matt Campbell. (laughs) So Matt Campbell and and Sark, big years for those two. Um, I'm sure we'll be talking more about the Big 12 and um, weekly odds and things like that, but just kind of wanted to run over some preseason numbers give some of our thoughts on what the what the tsi is telling us and uh just kind of uh, match that up with maybe what our eyeballs and brains are trying to to tell us so um we'll be back with another episode here we're going to do like so we're going to do all five power conferences here over the next week or so and then i think we'll try and sneak in maybe like a, a a group group of five or whatever episode and just that'll probably be a little disjointed but we'll just maybe pick some some teams we like and some some bets we like for that um but i appreciate everyone watching and listening um like i said link in the description box to the tissue index and uh the schedule projections so if you're looking to bet on the over-unders for win totals this season uh tyler's got a a model that projects out everything and you can kind of look at it and, and see and help you know maybe make some decisions for you so uh, appreciate everyone listening We will catch you again very soon. I think we're doing uh, SEC up next, so uh, stay tuned for that one.